I want to welcome you on behalf of the diversity committee from our school. I'm currently chairing the committee and we've put together a diversity webinar series for 2020. And today is our seventh webinar of the eight part series. We have one more in November. And our presenters are sharing content around diverse topics, uh, which align with the goals of inclusive excellence and diversity, equity, inclusion, which really uh, are the tied into our mission of the, the school as well as our college and our university. Uh, you will be able to find a full list of past presentations as well as the upcoming one uh, on our website. And I will share with you the, the upcoming webcast link as well as the uh, on-demand page where you can locate prior recordings. We do also have a YouTube playlist dedicated to the diversity series, and I will share that link in, in a moment in chat, and our podcasts. So several ways in which you can uh, access these uh, wonderful presentations afterwards. Tawana Hodge, she is the diversity, equity, and inclusion librarian at the University of Florida, George A. Smathers Libraries. And she's presenting today on integrating cultural humility into librarianship. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Tawana. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. So it is a pleasure to uh, be speaking to you all here uh, today. I appreciate uh, Michelle for doing a call for presenters um, and kind of accepting me to present on this topic. I first started learning about cultural humility um, over five years ago when I was a diversity resident librarian at the University of Utah um, and learning with this alongside Laura Lyra-Lidge and Alfred Maldu, who um, I credit for um, you know, being a part of the foundation for learning about this. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that it is National Hispanic Heritage uh, Month. This kind of goes beyond just, you know, acknowledging months or a celebration of awareness month, but to understand the contributions that those who are Hispanic or Latinx um, provide to this country and around the world um, as well. And that, you know, supporting people um, and celebrating them goes beyond just beyond a month, a day or a year. Um, also want to acknowledge that it's National Disability Employment Awareness Month, um, and this is actually the same year that ADA, the American uh, Disability Act, actually turns 30. And so there's a lot to uh, acknowledge um, and to celebrate um, in this regards and wanting to make sure that uh, people with disabilities, uh, whether it's physical um, or psychological, that they are able to bring their full selves uh, to work. So session objectives is that you'll learn about the, cult, the concept of cultural humility, the difference between cultural competency and cultural humility. Um, why should we integrate this into uh, librarianship um, as well as second, several recommendations um, and how to do so. Okay, so these are just some kind of conversation guidelines to help, um, you know, flow with the session here today. So respect, listening, um, using I statements, I think I feel not co-opting the experiences of someone else, feeling honored and present, um, acknowledging that there's a lot of things that's um, ongoing, you know, thinking about COVID-19, the fact, you know, civil unrest and other things of that nature. And so very uh, happy that you are here um, with us here today. Um, and so continuing to be engaged with us, the right to disagree. Um, understanding that, you know, there's there's conflict of opinions and there are the race disagreements that it's going to touch on that a little bit more. The right to risk or to pass because I will be engaging with you all and so I'm not going to be the stage on a stage um, type thing. I'm going to be asking you all questions and really wanting to engage with you all, uh, especially in the chat box and feel free to utilize the Q&A feature to ask me hard questions, challenging questions, questions that makes me pause and think. Um, I am assuming that you have good intentions because you are here today. Staying open to the process, you know, leaning into your discomfort, making space for others, um, and taking space for 
uh, taking up space where space traditionally has not been made uh, for folks and that this is a color break space. So if you identify as BIPOC, I want you to feel um, empowered uh, to uh, share your perspectives, to add comments, to ask questions. And this is from Deborah Daniels, University of Utah's Women Resource Center. And then next up are Brave Space Agreements. I initially learned about this through the ACRL virtual event. The keynote was Mackenzie Mack. Um, and I fell in love with these and I've been using them ever since, which has been a few months since then. Um, and so created by Mackenzie Mack, by, but inspired by Mickey Scott B. Jones. So the Brave Space Agreements are, we agree to struggle against racism, sizeism, transphobia, classism, sexism, and ableism. And the ways we internalize myths and misinformation about our own identities and identities of other people. We know that no space can be completely safe and we agree to work together to harm reduction, centering those most affected by injustice in a room, even if it means centering ourselves. We agree to sit with the discomfort that comes with having conversations about race, gender, identity, the nonprofit industrial con complex, etc. We agree to try our best not to shame ourselves for the vulnerability that these kinds of conversations require. We agree to value the viewpoints of other people that do not challenge a conflict with our right to exist or challenge a conflict with another's right to exist. We agree that it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to feel uncomfortable when we are discussing conflict topics about boundaries, accountability, personal relationships, organizational relationships, justice, and care. And so uh, if you agree, I would like for you, and if you have access to the chat box, to type in, I agree, that you agree with these brave space agreements. And as we um, have this conversation and learn more about cultural humility and other topics here today, that you um, abide by these agreements. So I'm gonna give people um, a few seconds to type in, I agree, if you agree with the Brave Space Agreements. And Tawana, I'm just gonna hop in because I don't know if you can see the chat, but we are getting uh, lots of I agrees, majority, actually all I agrees thus far. <laughs> okay, that is great because I don't have access uh, to the chat. Uh, so thank you everyone for um, agreeing to the Brave Space Agreements. And so uh, Michelle had um, talked about the progressive stacking and so I'm just gonna briefly reiterate it again in terms of if you, identi if you identify um, as uh, part of our marginalized group or underrepresented group, especially if you're BIPOC, to use an asterisk at the start of your question or, comp question or comment and then it gets routed to the top. Uh, so free, free to, to uh, do that. We acknowledge that you have to self-identify, but progressive stacking is a way to um, give uh, underrepresented voices the chance to speak first. Okay. So um, I just want to, you know, briefly do a breathing exercise. Um, and this is something that I've kind of adopted um, from one of the people I admire, um, Amanda Lefwich, she's a, a founder of Mindfulness in LAS, um, and just taking the moment to take a few deep breaths. You know, center around your body. Are you being present? You know, and being present. Um, what is your body telling you? What are you feeling? And just kind of sitting with that for like a few seconds. And it's just a way for us to calm down. You know, after we've probably been going since seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and that we have the opportunity to just um, sit and breathe for a moment. Thank you. All right, so ALA Code of Ethics. So most people have probably seen the LA Code ALA Code of Ethics. Why probably, you're probably thinking about why do I bring this up? Um, and this has been a core part of any culture humility presentation that I do. Um, because, you know, this is um, our guide to ethical decision making, kind of a framework for dealing with situation involving ethical conflicts. Um, and so one of the um, one of this is just we provide the highest level of service to all library users, you know, um, and so we essentially saying that anyone that comes through our doors, okay, that we serve them and we serve them through appropriate and usefully 
organized resources, equitable service policies, equitable access, and accurate, unbiased, and courteous responses to all requests. And this is something that we say that we strive to do um, day in and day out. Um, but one of the things, um, and I would want you all to uh, chime in in the chat box, um, when can you think about times where we haven't, you know, provided the highest level of service to all library users, you know, where we seem to be um, erring, erring on the side of inequitable service policies or inequitable, inequitable access that, you know, how we respond to requests can, can be biased um, at times. What are some examples that you can think of? Um, and this is not just true as libraries, but if you are outside of libraries, think about uh, the things that you do um, and the policies and procedures that we may um, uphold um, that are not, you know, serving everyone. So there have been um, a couple comments. So ebook access, uh, programming, uh, Library of Congress subject headings that are biased or old terminology. Yeah, and those and those are just some examples of many that we can think of. Um, and that's not to come from it from a deficient way of thinking. You know, libraries. You know, the goal of libraries providing access to information for all. You know, this is not a neutral. Um, or something that is objective, you know, uh, this is something that, you know, we are, you know, libraries are very passionate about, library work is a very passionate about, and has given so much to this, but also acknowledging that libraries are, ref are a reflection of the societies that we live in, and so we have taken on some of the um, negative biases, you know, we've taken on some of, you know, um, racist, sexist, you know, phobic systems and structures. Um, and, you know, we strive to move beyond that, you know, which is a, which is a great thing. Okay, prioritizing security of things over inclusivity, uh, such as creating barriers to people by, for example, requiring IDs to use the archives or special collections, uh, making assumptions about tech access, saying, quote, text us when you arrive, quote, for curbside pickup, for example. Mm -hmm. um, really, with COVID, there's a, a lot of discussion here about uh, shifting uh, in-person programs to online. Um, libraries currently opening, but only allowing access to students uh, that our university serves and not the public, though we have traditionally been a public library. Um, continue to support expensive sub subscription access publishing models that have been known behind a gate uh, mm -hmm. or keep knowledge behind the gate, I should say, uh, needing an address to sign up for a library card, uh, police presence, partners for security, um, library fines, another great example, uh, and then strict limits on which community members can enter or use the library even before COVID. So again, that, uh, that aspect. And there's several others, uh, forcing users to sign up for a card when they can choose not to, mm -hmm. uh, intimidating for, for their address when they might be or could be homeless, and also library website, maybe mostly in English. So there's little to no visibility of, say, world language resources. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are a lot of really great um, examples of some of the ways that um, gatekeeping um, occurs. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that for some of these, it's intentional and some of them are unintentional. They are just a, a byproducts of not really diving deeper into the changing demographics of our communities, you know. Um, and in regards to um, what happened earlier this summer um, that are still affecting us before, during, and still now, um, with the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Aubrey Amon, um, and the slew of people who um, I frame it as <laughs> uh, a lot of, most of America and um, other people globally acknowledging that racism is still a thing, you know, um, and that a lot of statements came out of that. Um, and, and, and understanding um, that for people of color in this country, their 
uh, how they operate, their lifestyles are vastly different than white so Caucasian folks um, worldwide, but particularly in America. And it's not to say that, you know, we are, um, you know, essentially saying, you know, white people are the root of all of this. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that um, as, as a Black woman, I live and navigate this world, particularly in this country, a little differently. Um, and so there was just a number of different statements that came out and acknowledging, you know, racism and anti-Black racism that, that exists, you know. Um, for those of you who may know, may not know, the librarianship profession is 86% white. Even with the inclusion of the ARL Kaleidoscope program, which was formerly known, um, I believe it was um, initiative to recruit a diverse workforce, as well as the Spectrums program. And if you're a Spectrum scholar, feel free to shout out um, in the chat box. Um, but you know, people they've recruited, um, particularly people of color, into the profession almost at the same time that people of color are leaving. You know. Um, and so really thinking about um, what is our retention policies and things of that nature. And San Jose State University, um, which is uh, libraries, which is an academic and research library, and even thinking about how um, the focus, the core commitment of values influence the things that we do, you know, that for ACRL, acknowledge and address historical racial inequities you know, challenge oppressive systems. And a lot of that is for us to start thinking about what do we know about the communities that we serve? What do we know about the history? And what ways have there, what ways have we um, have had gaps and how are we correcting those gaps? And that all of these different statements, you know, means that we have not been doing this on a, um, you know, mainstream level previously. And there's been library, um, there's been articles that's been written about how even in libraries, we, though we fight for democracy, um, you know, there's a way that we end up um, promoting whiteness and wherein everything that is not white is other, you know, and getting, and getting at that and getting at what does it mean if somebody who's undocumented um, looks at our catalog, our library catalog and see the use of illegal aliens, you know? And this is referring to the documentary, Change the Subject, um, which I would suggest that people uh, watch if you're unfamiliar with it. And I'm thinking about vocational awe, you know? Uh, and for Vizzy article, like amazing article that was written over two years ago. And if you're not familiar with it, I strongly suggest that you read it. But for this article, um, basically asking us to think about, um, you know, we think of librarianship as being inherently good, sacred notions, and therefore beyond critique. Um, and for us to be able to turn, for us to be able to take a look at ourselves, you know, to reflect um, and to critique, which are um, a part of uh, cultural humility. Uh, yes, I will post the name of the documentary into the chat box. And so culture is, um, culture is our way of living. It is complex, it is dynamic, continually involving, constantly in flux by our experiences, by the people that um, come into this country, the people that live here, people who were born and raised here, people who immigrate here, it's always in flux. And the food and the language um, and the things that we cherish, you know? But there's also isms and phobias. So racism, sexism, classism, sizism, ableism, ethnocentrism, anti-Semitism, ageism, and phobias such as homophobia, islamophobia, xenophobia, and transphobia. If there's any that I might be missing, feel free to add them to uh, the chat box. Um, but a question to you all, have you all experienced these in terms of people who have been, you know, sexist or racist or classist or elitist? Um, you know, in terms of academic institutions, um, there's that difference between like if you're affiliated with the institution versus not. 
you know, sizeism, ableism, even thinking about ableism and those with um, um, invisible um, disability versus a physical disability. You know, what has been your experiences like? Um, what, what have you had to fight for? And Tawana, I'll just jump in real quick um, about the documentary. Is that changed the subject? Is that the one you're referring to? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just so everybody knows, I'll put it in the chat. Change the subject is being aired on PBS for free through December. So I'm going to put the, um, the link into the chat for all of you. And there were just a few additional comments I want to add here. Uh, someone mentioned earlier about creating programming centered only on white clientele when the community is changing and adding a collection in different language is not enough. So everyone should be represented equally, as well as continuing to support library publishers and vendors who do not comply with current accessibility standards. So even considering accessibility. Uh, and uh, you're asking about isms, rank ism, particularly within academic institutions, um, sizeism. So feeling like there's something that is overlooked a lot, sizeism. Mm -hmm. Those are the other two that came up. Thank you. Um, thank you for contributing, um, you all. Um, and I will make sure to update. Uh, this slide to include um, the things that you all have added from the chat box. Um, and so I'm going to go through these next few slides a little quickly because I think at this point everyone knows what implicit bias is um, and kind of understanding that uh, they're pervasive, um, they're separate and distinct from implicit biases and beliefs in most cases, and they take consistent long-term effort to um, minimize your bias response. Um, and uh, from this article from um, Andrews, Kim, and Watanabe, uh, Culture, Humility is Transformative Framework for Librarian Students and Youth, just kind of some examples, you know, of, you know, people might feel uncomfortable, they have varying levels of comfort with cultures outside of their own. Sometimes, you know, people have a tendency to declare a patron's or a student name is too difficult to pronounce or spell. You know, and say so they give them maybe an English sounding name or they give them a nickname. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had my name misspelled, even even by Zoom. You know, um, it defaults to not my correct name, spelling name. You know, feeling to support boisterous patrons, students or young adults. You know, I may not feel comfortable telling them to, you know, maybe quiet down, um, you know, have a tendency to maybe call the cops. Um, making assumptions about the home life or the culture of the patron. We have a tendency to lead to those assumptions. We have these automatic associations that occur um, from the media, from previous um, experiences um, that allow us to kind of make those associations, those assumptions, and being able to relate to diverse life experiences. So there's this place association test that exists. Um, and it's just a way to kind of try to figure out what our implicit biases may be. There's been a lot of uh, debate and conversation about the validity of it and things of that nature. I'm not here to tell you, you must take it or anything like that. Uh, this is just one of uh, several ways of trying to get at what our implicit biases um, might be. And our biases uh, impact, they may not always kind of lead to an action necessarily. Uh, it might just be things that we, we, we think or perceive of others. Um, but when we engage with other people, uh, these, these, these associations have a tendency to uh, control us whether we are conscious of them or not. There are a privilege checklist that exist. So these are just a few. Um, and to just, you know, quickly read from one from each, from the thin privilege check checklist. I can go home from meetings, classes, and conversations and not feel excluded, fearful, attacked, isolated, outnumbered, um, unheard, or afraid at a distance because of the size of my body. I can worry about, this is from the um, white privilege checklist. Um, I can worry about racism without being seen as a self-interested or self-interested or self-seeking. 
And from the able privilege checklist, parts of your body or extensions of your body are not referred to as that thing. And so now, um, what I want to do is uh, for you all to briefly do this activity. Um, and so I am going to put the link into the chat box for you all. Um, and so what it is that I want you all to do um, is to, using this wheel, um, identifying you know, the privilege that you have, whether it's language, gender, age, um, you know, you could write down for age if you're young, middle age, if you're older. Um, and on the line, essentially, you're going to write down, well, not write down, but you could if you wanted to, but you can just uh, mentally just state, where do you think, um, if it's closer to the middle, your, your identity have more privilege. If it's um, closer to the edge, it has less privilege. Um, and then thinking about, um, and then part of the activity that I want a few people to share in the chat box is to identify three salient identities that means the most to you, that you, that, that is important to you, um, and kind of list why. And so let me bring up the chat box and give you guys this link. So, um, I will give you all a minute or two to do it, uh, to work on this, but essentially you're going to kind of look at this um, and um, for this activity to identify three identities that are important to you, because what is important to you is not always important to, um, is not important, what's important to you is not always what other people ascribe to you um, or wanna talk to you about essentially, uh, or deem that should be important to you. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you a minute to do this. Um, and as you think about this, uh, I'm just gonna go through the next few, few slides. Um, but I really do want a few brave participants, volunteers, um, to just put in the chat box what your three important identities are and why. Okay, so some bias reducing strategies and you all will have access to this PowerPoint presentation. And like I said, feel free to add questions into the chat box. So stereotype replacement is, um, you know, recognizing a stereotype has been activated. Think about why, and then, you know, you actively substitute a non-stereotypical thought. Counter stereotypic imaging is, um, Imagining an individual situation that counteracts your stereotype. Um, people might assume that women are bad drivers and envisioning that, you know, a woman is a NASCAR driver, things of that nature. Um, another one is positive context. So this is, I think, something that libraries do particularly well is positive context, increasing opportunities for positive con context with members of a stereotyped group. Um, so I see this happening in academic and public libraries and in other libraries as well. So I'm going to stop right there and see if there was any folks who um, added anything to the chat box. No responses yet, but again, this is completely voluntary. And if you'd like to share, uh, and what was it, three identities as well as why you chose them? Yeah, from the wheel. Um, and so if you, you know, say that um, age, education, um, or, or, you know, race, um, and race, if you're, if you're black, kind of really thinking about what are the things that's most important to you? Because I think a lot of times we don't have the opportunity to stop and reflect and think about what are all my identities? you know, um, and being able to call them out. And so uh, community support is being able to find um, organizations, associations, and groups that support, um, that support or um, aids in your different identities so that you can find, like say a therapist, um, you can find um, grocery stores that uh, sell food that you're familiar with, that you grew up eating, 
um, that you're able to find uh, religious support in that in your community. Um, and so, you know, things that uh, can culturally validate you. Thank you for that question, Laura. Um, and so Francis uh, um, put in the chat box, education, religion, and age, um, that they shape how they think about the world and, and that they change. And that's the thing is that our identities and what our selling identities might change over time, you know? Um, and so for us to be able to acknowledge that, and some of them are social constructs that um, um, power and meaning have been infused, you know, into them. Um, and so thank you all for, for sharing. And so onto the thing that you all was probably itching to, to get at. Um, so culture humility. Culture humility incorporates a lifelong commitment. So this is not something you, um, you know, can decide I'm just going to do it for like two seconds and then that's it. Um, and this is self-evaluation and self-critique. And it's not critiquing to say that it's in a deficient way of, of thinking or anything like that. You know, it's to acknowledge that we can't possibly know everything that there is to know about a particular uh, group um, and their culture. Um, and a question I will pose to you all, um, what do you, uh, what would you, how would you describe American culture? And so feel free to put in the chat box, you know, how would you describe American culture, particularly to someone who did not, was, did not grow up in America, was not born and raised here. And so as people are populating in the chat box, I'm just gonna continue with this definition. And it's redressing the power imbalances. And in this particular, this is coming from uh, the medical field in regards to the patient physician dynamic and developing mutually beneficial and non paternalistic partnerships. Uh, it is being other oriented or person or patron centered. Um, it is honoring who that person is and what they bring. Okay. Is engaging in constant and consistent self reflection. And that self reflection and that reflection piece. Uh, can be um, in isolation or it can be with a group of people who you trust, who um, have the ability to call you in um, and call you out depending on what is needed. Um, is re expressing respect and a lack of superiority, even when cultural differences are present. And so it's not kind of falling into that trap of ethnocentrism of, of, of believing that one culture is superior to another. Um, or, you know, one perspective um, or lifestyle is superior to another. But I'm going to stop right there and see if there was any f folks who responded to the question, how would you describe American culture, especially, especially to someone who was not born or raised here? I think everyone's really excited and engaged with the identity exercise. So I don't know that we've moved to that question, but it's been great, the engagement and the sharing here. So thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Um, let me see if I can see the chat box. Okay, yes, now I can see the okay. chat box. Um, yes, thank you so much for sharing um, and just scrolling up and just looking at looking at some of this, um, because when we think about it, like the identities that we hold, they have a, they have a culture to them, a set of norms um, and mannerisms um, and language and, you know, how we, you know, talk to certain people, how we don't talk to certain people and, you know, who we engage to, you know, uh, whether we pray in the morning or not, you know, or take Sundays off or not, you know, um, or how we dressed, um, things of that nature. And so, um, and understanding that, you know, for me, I was born and raised in St. Thomas, you know, which is a island, I like to say in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, it's 32 square miles, you know, um, I'm American by birth, birthright citizenship. Um, but I, I did not grow up in the mainland, you know, and so that's very different to, from the black people that I've met who was born and raised here. You know, um, and though we we are black, you know, I consider myself Afro-Caribbean, um, you know, my experiences are vastly different. 
you know, and, and even within um, BIPOC and even within folks who um, are melanated, you know, their experiences are not all the same, you know. And, and there's something this expectation that, you know, all BIPOC people um, know all BIPOC people uh, and have the similar experiences. Not exactly, no. Um, and so if people are putting in, you know, in terms of like, how would they describe American culture? And, you know, some people are saying American exceptionalism, you know, very xenophobic and hateful at times, uh, consumerism heavy, uh, you know, self-worth through consumeristic ideals and different stuff like that. Um, and, you know, people ha are saying similar things, people are saying different things. And so really understanding that, depending on who you are and where you, where you were born, which, um, t I wouldn't know to say timeline, which generation you were born into, the movements, you know, that kind of influences how people perceive and experience the world. Um, and so, you know, thinking about that. Um, and so for me, cultural, cultural competency, uh, which has been um, something that has, has been integrated in so many disciplines. And there was even a class I had in graduate school that talked about cultural competency. The challenge with cultural competency, um, I think, is that there's people who believe that we can be competent in a culture, in ours, in other people's, <laughs> excuse me, that there is a set of characteristics or criteria uh, that you can read this book chapter and not really understand, um, you know, uh, Native Americans um, and, you know, their relationship with the healthcare system and different stuff like that. Um, and to acknowledge that, one, we, there's, there's, there's no, and, and for somebody to say that competency that, uh, that, you know, if we do this one thing, we get the stamp of approval, we are competent. We don't, we don't need any ongoing um, training or education on this. And it also, to me, pro puts the onus on that person from that culture to educate us, to educate me on your culture. And the flip side with cultural humility, um, or maybe cultural humility is kind of a, a, um, a, on the spectrum, which is kind of a, a moving point or the next step, um, is that cultural humility is, you know, for us taking on the onus of educating ourselves about different uh, communities that we're working and engaging with. Um, and so uh, for cultural humility, it can empower a stronger sense of pride in one culture uh, that you don't have to uh, make excuses or provide disclaimers or anything like that, acknowledging and, and, and feeling, um, feeling a sense of, like they say, pride um, and encouraging, you know, people to respect one another's culture um, and not, somebody mentioned that, um, a melting pot. A melting pot is essentially that you're, you're losing aspects of yourself and you're assimilating into someone else's culture. And that's not what we mean. Um, and I think, you know, that libraries have an opportunity to dismantle dominant stereotypical narratives because we're in the business of collecting information from everyone's perspective, you know, um, and making sure that um, we are working with those communities that we are um, collecting from and we acknowledging that our previous practices have been uh, questionable at best, um, extremely traumatizing um, and problematic at worst, but acknowledging that I'm working on um, restorative justice and reconciliation um, in different aspects. And that um, self-reflection is realistic and ongoing self-appraisal, it's mindfulness, it's taking the time. We're so busy. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, there's, there's that pridefulness in being busy. Um, but we're so busy that we, um, at tendency, and we have so much that puts on us, that you're doing four people's job at once, um, that we're unable to take the time to be mindful. You know, that would allow us to check our, our power imbalances and challenge assumptions. You know, um, understanding that this is sustained commitment. Um, and it's and it's like when you're exercising, you know, you haven't done it for a while um, and you're trying to get your body to 
um, to do this. And so you're not trying to do everything at once, but you're starting off um, in bits and pieces that are sustainable. This is active engagement. It's not passive. You know, somebody is not watching this presentation or the other things um, or, or diving into the other resources is not going to mean that, aha, you know, you're just consuming it and you're not doing anything with it. And that this is lifelong. There's no checklist. There's no stopping point. You're not going to get a, a handout that's like, this is step one, and then this is step 50. If you do this, then this happens. That's, <laughs> that's the beauty of cultural humility um, to me. Um, be humble. And so this is a model. Be humble about the assumptions you make um, about knowing the world from your patients or patrons or colleagues. Shoes, this is not always uh, patron-centered or focused. Um, understand how your own background can impact the care or uh, the service that you provide for your patrons. Motivate to learn more about other people's background and culture. For me, it's, it feels like it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to wait until bodies drop, until lives are lost, um, until people feel that they are dehumanized in order for us to uh, do the necessary work to learn about others. And as you learn an understanding, you know, about different perspectives, um, begin incorporating this into how you understand people and engage with them, that this is lifelong learning um, and emphasize respect um, and really just generally listening to people. So we're going to stop right there and see if there's any questions or comments um, before I move on. Juana, I have a, a comment I want to mention here. So I teach a new course at San Jose, uh, Cultural Competence for Information Professionals. And the way I've really described cultural competence uh, is that it's a journey. And it's ongoing. It's not you, you go through these steps and you're proficient. So it's a, I think it ties in with it's lifelong learning, but it's also a, an, an engagement process um, it may change. You might, you know, take 10 steps back and then maybe 10 steps forward, but it's not really linear mm -hmm. in the sense that it is an ongoing journey. Um, and I really like how you describe how cultural humility uh, is, it's different in the spectrum and how it fits in, um, if it's in with cultural competency and really the, the self-awareness, the biases, understanding your own values and value orientations. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate um, this piece and I'm gonna ensure my students listen to this if they're not here today, uh, because it directly relates to the course I'm teaching. And um, I even think I will modify and add just a specific module on cultural humility. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, and there, there are pros and cons, well, there's, there's pros and cons with anything. And I think with cultural competency, there is a lot of things to be taken from it, mm -hmm. uh, and to be embedded and to be utilized. Um, and, you know, uh, there's an article that's out there that, uh, talks about like the com combination of competency and humility. Um, I can't remember the exact term cause it legitimately combined it. Um, hmm. but I'll find that article and, and, and send it to you, Michelle. Um, but yeah, and so it's essentially thinking about, um, you know, that humility aspect of being, for me, um, for those who ever worked, you know, virtual chat and were reference desk before, you, somebody comes up or even, um, you know, you get that ding and you don't know what they're going to ask. You know, you don't know if you're going to be able to answer it you know, um, and, and, and taking some level of comf um, comfort in that, you know, and, and, and knowing that um, you're going to be conducting that reference interview, you're going to be asking those, those questions, and even being conscious about the questions we ask, and how some of those questions we ask can reinforce assumptions, you know, and, and may end up making the person uncomfortable to even reveal some more, you know. And Tawana, there is a, a question that's come into the chat, if you might want to address it now. Um, I see it. Um, in the q and I'm sorry, it's not in the chat. What are the best ways to deal with personal biases to you? I find, it, I find that it is important to library workers to understand other cultures, and that because of seniority, learning about other people's culture does not seem to be important to their work anymore. How must a large library system make sure that this is a priority and this is important? Uh, to answer your first question, um, I think 
once you understand what your biases are, um, I think really looking at um, like the bias reducing strategies, um, you know, is one way to learn how to reduce your bias response. Um, I think it's being able to engage in that, that self-reflection. Um, it's having people you trust, like in different settings who are willing to call you out. Um, and literally when I say call you, I mean like call you out, um, you know, um, and, you know, willing to, to take that time to teach you, you know, what might've been a call you or call you in, um, but to kind of help you, um, think about, um, maybe there's another way that this could have been said or, or, or even thinking about our moments of silence. Um, and in terms of prioritization from, um, those who are in senior or administrative in leadership positions. Um, I think for me, I always uh, connect it back to what is the mission, vision, um, and strategic plan. You know, if it has anything in there about providing a welcoming and uh, welcoming inclusive community, um, how can we do that if we don't generally know what our community and understand how our biases can potentially and most of the time impact how we design programming, the services that we provide people you know, how are we making sure that we are getting um, critical feedback? How are we keeping ourselves accountable, you know, to these, to these things that we said that we are, we are doing? At my university, um, after in their acknowledging um, racism, their 15 point plan, you know, they talked a lot about, you know, focusing on black experience for 2021 and different stuff like that. Um, and there's been a number of statements that came out from different organizations and for me is, is following up with them. Um, if they don't make it a priority um, and if it's not an important to them, then what is? If, 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 um, if it's not serving their community in a way, in a way that everyone feels um, welcome and invited and feel like they belong, then what else is more important? Um, and I, <laughs> Um, and I've, I've, I frame it that way because we are in the business of supporting people, um, including our colleagues, including our patrons. So um, we have to be able to understand what their lived experiences are and making sure that they do not feel like they are perpetual uh, strangers um, or that they are othered um, in this country, that they have every right to be considered a human being and have um, basic human dignity and respect. So honey, I hope that hopefully that I've answered your question. Um, Aaron, you're interested in other ways, in ways other libraries have engaged their cultural communities to find out the resources program and support that they want from their library. So I think that this is, it could be a question to um, folks in the, uh, who are participating and who are here. So feel free to chime in and answer, um, answer that question. Um, I think for me in my job, I've been here for eight months. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to uh, systematically dive into the community, but I've embraced the opportunities of meeting with other people. Um, and letting them connect me to others, that relationship building, um, that trust, but acknowledging that libraries from a lot of underserved and underrepresented communities, that libraries may not be seen as a place that they trust because it's an institution. Um, and at times libraries have not been for the people. And so it's acknowledging that historical and intergenerational trauma, um, acknowledging that there is um, trust uh, that has been um, eroded to the point that it doesn't exist anymore. And it's really figuring out um, the history, you know, what has happened, um, what is still happening. Um, and it's not just the job of like a community engagement person or department, it's everyone's job. Because when somebody comes into the library, they, for the general public or for any student faculty or staff, they're not going to say, understand the person from the front desk, you know, from an AD, uh, essentially. And so it's getting everyone to understand that part of their job is working to learn about their communities. Um, oh gosh, I have eight minutes left. So Aaron, hopefully I've answered your question. Um, and I think that there are other people who, um, will, who might respond to this question, but I think it's a great question. 
Okay. Um, engaging in reflective practice, um, I won't hammer <laughs> this um, any further, um, but guiding questions for critical reflection. So in what ways do I consider my patients' unique circumstances? Do I lump them together and base my interaction and previous experiences with members from their cultural groups? You know, what, in what ways are unit library, so like your unit or department or library, state, national, international organization, association policies, enact racism, classism, sexism, and other power relations? So taking it into uh, these policies and procedures that we, you know, uphold, you know, and thinking about um, are they reinforcing um, the um, particular uh, perspectives and people that we, that we serve, you know? What are my own cultural experiences? You know, how do they shape my practice? Um, and so openness, reflective practice, journaling. I used to not be a really great journaler, um, but even if it's just jotting down a few thoughts and it's carving time out of your day, whether it's in the beginning, middle or end, to engage in this, this reflective practice, um, which journaling can help you with. And so kind of getting closer to the end of my presentation, because I really do want other people to ask me a lot more uh, questions uh, and to challenge me. I'm, I'm always excited about that. Um, so things for the trainings and other stuff that we do. Using non-dominant first-person perspective. So really thinking about if you're a professor, who's, who's in your syllabus? Um, and it goes beyond just like um, adding, you know, citing black women or, you know, citing people of color and things of that nature. It's really looking at like, do you have a statement that encourages definition, not definitions, encouraging discussion um, on uh, controversial, uncomfortable topics, um, you know, because I'll get to that a little bit later. Using lived experience, you know, there's people who privilege credentials over lived experience, and to me, they, one should not be privileged over the other. When I used to teach instruction sessions, you know, I used to use the example that, you know, you could have somebody who has a PhD in molecular engineering, um, and if they're writing about or have a blog about uh, taking care of 4C here, um, and they are uh, a white woman, then, um, and they don't have 4C here, then that's someone you're not going to want to utilize either for styling or if you're, if you're doing research into, um, you know, Black women who have 4C here. Um, encourage groups to explain their reasoning. Use examples that reverse common stereotypes and discuss race, social class, and privilege. Um, and there's been um, information about how the demographics of higher ed is changing, the demographics of this nation is changing, and making sure that we are being proactive and not reactive. And so, um, you know, with COVID-19 acknowledging that community involvement might be incredibly difficult, especially since a lot of you all mentioned about um, in order to use the library, you have to be, especially an academic library, you have to be affiliated in some way, shape or form. But I think, you know, providing the opportunity uh, for the community to be involved in different steps of the way and for them to be co-creators in some of the things that we do. Um, you know, providing opportunities for positive encounters, which is what this is part of and which this is doing. Um, and question how your biases may affect the services you provide at your library. And remembering that learning happens through discomfort. Areas of growth for ourselves, some key takeaways, and is engaging in these conversations. I have a ton of resources. That is what I'm really good at. <laughs> My references. And Kimberly Crenshaw, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who is known as the founder of intersectionality. Um, if we can't see a problem, we can't fix a problem. And so any other questions? And then this is my contact information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tawana. This was, I took like two pages of notes. <laughs> so this is really informative for me and in, um, in my courses and what I'm doing and to support um, students. And so if there are any questions, we have about three minutes, but 
if there is a question, if you can go ahead and put it in the, um, the Q&A and we'll let um, Tawana um, address those. And yes, someone asked about the resources citations. You will get a copy. It, I won't say you will get a copy. On our website, we will post the recording as well as a um, PDF of uh, the presentation and any other resources that um, Tawana would like to share. Yes, and I can stay on for maybe another five to 10 minutes if there's any pressing questions. Um, and like I said, I want you all to question and challenge critical thinking. Um, you know, things that you heard um, me uh, talk about or state. Um, and uh, you, you all are most welcome. I enjoy uh, sharing the gospel. Let me stop. Uh, sharing information, <laughs> uh, culture, humility, and there's so much more to learn. Um, every time I do this, I learn a little bit more myself um, and through engaging with you all. Um, and so I'm really excited and I see some familiar people who are in attendance and, you know, new folks. So thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, but, and you don't have to struggle in this alone. You know, like this is not like an isolated um, activity. I don't want you to think that you have to like, you know, um, enclose yourself into a dark space by yourself <laughs> and work on this, you know, um, it's, it's, it's forming a community, you know, and, and it's, and it's taking time to like weave this into, into your practice, you know, um, and when I learned about this, you know, five years ago, it was a struggle for me too. And I'm still learning different ways to, um, you know, employ this, but also even, you know, mentally checking myself, you know, um, be like, why do I think this way? Like, Tuana, like, why, why are you responding in this, in this, in this manner? You know, um, and, and, and forcing me to kind of like, even think about things before I say them, you know? Um, and sometimes we think that um, these things end in just kind of like, whether we do decide to do some things. Also, when we don't decide to do something, when we decide not to say hi to someone, or look them in the face, or to even just acknowledge their existence, you know. Um, and there's times where um, sometimes that's just what people want, you know, is just to know that you see them as a human being and you treat them as such and they don't have to fight um, for basic I think human dignity. Too, Tawana, too, you just made me think about reflection and taking the space and the time to reflect on, you know, if a situation does occur or actually every interaction we have, but taking that time to really reflect on your own reactions or your own behaviors and, you know, maybe what went right, what went wrong, what you could do better, how we can each improve while we're on this, um, on this journey, as I call it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the reflection practice is a great um, tool, we'll say. Yes. to really help you um, to inform and also to, you know, retool yourself if you need to, if something does occur. Yeah. Um, yes, we, this is lifelong. We are works in progress mm -hmm. to not put additional pressure on ourselves to be like, we should, I need to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, I've said this before. It's not about um, just seeing the right thing. It's about doing the right thing. You know, that, that, that action piece that I think a lot of people are, are clamoring for, you know, in this moment. Um, and I appreciate everyone who um, came. This has been great. Um, I have enjoyed this uh, so much. And please, my contact information is there. Reach out to me um, if you have any additional questions. Um, if you want to provide feedback, did I talk too quickly? Did I say on to I'm just joking. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you did great. You're fabulous. I, I so appreciate you um, and your, your time, your expertise, um, and the value you're bringing to, uh, you know, those that are here today, but also those that listen to this later. Um, it's invaluable. You can't put a price on it. So I really appreciate you. Um, I, yes, <laughs> I didn't even have to say, but I don't see any other questions. Um, so thank you again. I see tons of thank yous. Um, and yes, very important to support each other and for our communities. Um, any final final thoughts before I, I close this out? Well, we're all in this together. Um, and our liberation is tied to the liberation of others. 
Um, and so I so appreciate um, everyone who's attended and who are continuing to do this work and involving others in this work as well. Thank you. Fabulous. I think you wrapped it up beautifully. So I'm just going to close with that. And again, thank each of you for attending or listening to this and to our wonderful speaker, Tawana, for being here today. Thank Take you. care and have a great day, everyone. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.